Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this session on the pathogenesis of infection. I'm Dawn Nguyen from McGill University, and I have with me as co-chair Anna Clara Galdino from uh, Cedar sinai Medical Center. So as all of you have seen either in clinic or have heard over the course of this uh, conference so far, it's clear that highly effective um, modulator therapy is changing the landscape of CF. And with that, there's also dramatic changes in what CF infections look like. Um, patients that are on highly effective modulated therapy um, have a lower prevalence of infection, um, the, and they see lower burden of um, classical pathogens. And so what, what will this look like? Well, it's also important to remember that many patients are not eligible for highly effective mod modulated therapy, and that of the classical pathogens, even with complete correction of CFTR, they still have the, um, the uh, uh, possibility of causing disease as non-CF bronchiectasis patients, as an example, give us evidence for. So today, um, this session is really focused on a variety of different pathogens that you'll recognize. And hopefully, this will bridge the gap of some of the, the things lesser known about them. And so we're covering, um, as a starting point, uh, a talk on pseudomonas, uh, particularly in the context of um, sinusitis, which often we don't think about as much as pulmonary disease. And um, we will be hearing about Staph aureus and small colony variants. And we know that they are associated in patients with worse um, lung uh, outcome, but um, what about the pathophysiology of small colony variants? Um, many of you are thinking about non-tuberculous mycobacteria. You were perhaps uh, at the workshop uh, at the symposium this morning on the pathogenesis. So it's clearly a very pro problematic uh, class of infections of which we still have no um, very little. And so we'll have two talks on non-tuberculous mycobacteria. And we'll end on perhaps not classically thinking of you know, pathogenesis of infection, but thinking about the uh, role of respiratory viruses in the pathogenesis of uh, pulmonary exacerbations in our last talk. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Cho, um, who's Associate Professor at the University of Alabama in Birmingham, who's going to talk to us about pseudomonas in the context of a model of sinusitis. OK, oh, thank you so much. Uh, it's my great honor. Um, my name is Doyon Chu. I'm the Associate Professor at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. Uh, it's my, uh, I'm a rhinologist. I'm, it's my really prestigious to speak in front of the prestigious microbiologists here today. So uh, I call myself snot surgeon. So I've been working with the rabbit model for the last eight years. So I'm going to talk about my uh, research about the rabbit sinusitis model. Just one second. Let me just uh, laser pointer. Okay. Okay, I don't have no disclosure. Let me talk about the sinusitis first. Sinusitis inflammation and the sinus cavity. So the blue is like more, right here is ethmoid cavity, and this is a, this is a maxillary sinus. So sinusitis is a max uh, inflammation sinus cavity. About the rhinitis is the inflammation in the nasal cavity. We sometimes call the rhinosinusitis, which means the sinusitis always accompanied inflammation in the nasal cavity. That's why I call the rhinosinusitis. However, rhinitis doesn't mean the sinus disease. When you go to urgent care and like give you like facial pain, pressure, but allergic hay fever, it's not really considered as a sinusitis, a rhinitis. But sinusitis means also rhinosinusitis. But the diagnosis of chronic or acute sinusitis, clinical diagnosis, which means how long do you have the symptoms? What are the symptoms that you have? So that's why it's very difficult to uh, identify the animal because we can talk to the animal. How long have you had symptoms? You know, animal can answer those questions. So the diagnosis of sinusitis, the animal model, is usually by histology, make sure there's no inflammatory cells, maybe chronic versus acute inflammations. Let me start the case. This case makes me very humble. This is a 55-year-old female came from the outside hospital for frontal sinus. Usually, CF patient doesn't have a frontal sinus. They usually don't develop that much. But this patient is uh, 55, had frontal sinus multiple years. She actually, frontal sinus is actually, here is the white is the bone, and the black is the air, and the gray is all the soft tissue. Her frontal sinus left side is so bad that actually eroded bone, so inflammation, infection going to the eye, she almost getting blind. So she actually had keep on infections. And then um, 
and then she's actually keep on having these infections, and then she's she's her sinus looks amazing, but she's having MRSA, MSSA, and a pseudomonas infection. But she finally died. I was able to diagnose her age of 55 with CF. The reason, another one finding, is that she actually had this intraepithelial abscess in her sinus cavity, which is very commonly seen in patients CF. This is right here. This is an abscess right here. So the pseudomonas, or those bacteria, are actually hiding inside of the tissue. It doesn't go ex- outside of the sinus epithelium. It's called the intraepithelial abscess. You see there are also multiple abscesses here, here, and here. All those micro abscesses, so we can able to see it. So based on this finding, I'm just going to start my uh, presentation. This is a very common finding of delta 508 sinusitis that actually on the left cheek sinus, this is a patient actually, unfortunately, the patient passed away recently because of pulmonary uh, bleeding after sinus surgery. So it's very sad. But this patient, these type of sinus patients, actually CF patients, uh, actually have a lot of thick mucus. It's like pus bucket. When we're having a surgery, which means we have to go in and dig in all those pus tissue. There are a lot of reports says coming from sinus disease. They said the variety of bacteria is coming out this sinusitis or the CF, aerobic and aerobic faculty anaerobes. But the culture is usually doesn't able to detect the anaerobes, and they think that a lot of unde- undetected anaerobes may play a pathogenic role in these type of pathogenesis. There has been regarding anaerobe cystic fibrosis. There has been uh, there there are multiple studies which demonstrate some conflicting results. So it could be a good or it could be a bad. So still debating about this anaerobes in the CF uh, airways. Uh, when I'm looking at the short chain fatty acid level in the chronic sinus disease uh, with student, this is with and without uh, CF. This is a small cohort of patients. So short chain fatty acid, it's kind of like activities, a kind of marker for whether there's an anaerobe related to mucin fermentation activity. So when I check this uh, collecting me can send out for a mass spec, whether they have any evidence short chain fatty acids, they're all three short chain fatty acids, which is acetate, propionate, and butyrate, that are significantly higher compared to the healthy controls in these patients. So to understand this as a cross-feeding theory in the, uh, about between the mucin fermenting microbes and pseudomonas, I developed a rabbit model of sinus disease. What I initially did is I packed a rabbit's nose about two weeks of mare cells without putting in bacteria, and then removed the mare cell about two weeks and see what's going on afterwards. And they leave the rabbit about like uh, 12 weeks, so a total of about 14 weeks and see what happens. In acute stage, you see that there's a lot of mucin fermenting microbes like Bacteroidalis, uh, Bacillus, and Lactobacillus, and Clostridiolus. These are like a kind of findings here, like brownish, and then also like gray. These are kind of mucin fermenting uh, microbes are predominant. However, if, uh, also at the same time, all this, uh, the short chain fatty acid levels are significantly higher. However, the chronic stage, all these bacteria have been changed, shift to, to more pathogenic bacteria like a Burkholderialis and Pseudomonalis. So, which means that you see that this is like yellow is the uh, it says orange is a pseudom- uh, Pseudomonalis, and this is the uh, light orange is more Burkholderialis. So they're actually con- c- slowly growing up in these uh, in these sinuses. When there's an anaerobe initially to develop, and we notice that there's like gram negative coming afterwards. And a lot of people question ask me why using the rabbits because the main reason rabbit has a very similar immunology features to humans. They actually closer a uh, chromosome count. Rabbit has forty four, human is forty six. I think mat, uh, mice is a forty and the rat is forty two. And also the important thing is that they do have some, some mucosa gland in the sinus cavity. Some of the mirror model they don't have it. And there are a lot of uh, in, vi- in vivo rabbit sinus model which was demonstrated uh, starting in the year two thousands. So UAB has a very excellent micro CT scan. We're able to scan the uh, CT really well with, uh, with the rabbits. And you can see here the sinus, rabbit has a really good sinus cavity. It's in the left and right aeration. This is a human sinuses. He's like very similar to human. This is a top. This is a left sinus, right sinus. So in these sinus, you work at this sinus as kind of like in vivo incubator. So I can't incubate any of the bacteria there and see there are C host and micro interaction in these sinuses. Great thing about C after rabbit is that rabbit responds to a lot of therapeutic drugs, not only for, uh, but a lot of mur- murans, they don't respond to VX770 or their therapeutics, but they also, rabbit has a very good response with its drugs at the same time. So based on this, my question is whether, not blaming the anaerobes, if there's something going on with pseudomonas, uh, what if I give a lot of acetate propionate 
and see what happens if the Pseudomonas utilize this metabolism of acetate propionate. See, the question is whether acetate and propionate metabolism by Pseudomonas can contribute to sinus inflammations. So this is not CF, but we've seen a lot of patients in this clinic that sometimes pseudomonas become very virulent. This is a patient has odontogenic sinus disease, which means coming from anaerobes. In the mouse, it coming to the sinus, turn out to be pseudomonas, now getting to the orbit, she lost her vision in the right eye, even after all the treatments. A lot of times pseudomonas are very invasive, especially presence of the anaerobes. And I just want to answer this question, why pseudomonas become so invasive in these circumstances. So to answer this question, I need some mutants. So I got the mutants. Uh, we're not talking about the mutant uh, B. fragilis, but I got this B. fragilis from Dr. Edson uh, Raj from the Eastern Carolina University. And also I got the PA-14 mutant from Ryan Hunter from University of Minnesota. So we got a wild type PA-14 and also mutant PA-14, which doesn't utilize acetate propionate. So I able to infect those, eat the rabbits with the uh, anaerobic bacteria plus pseudomonas which can utilize acetate, which does not utilize acetate, and see what there's any responses different between those two rabbits. So based on the plus one study by the Ryan Hunter, it says the propion and acetate utilization mutants, they are defective in the growth when they act a cool culture with the oral anaerobes. So when I get this mutant so I first did a CFU count. Uh, as you can see right here in this, uh, in this graph, I put it on the testing tube, which is very similar to previous studies by Ryan Hunter, the oxygen gradient tubes. In the bottom, we put the mucin fermenting micro, which is uh, bacteroidoides, and we put the uh, porcelain mucin and also put the pseudomonas on the top. So pseudomonas colony counts are significantly higher when the wild type strains are grown with the B. fragilis and mucins comparing to double mutant PA14 strains, which means that the when there's a uh, acetate and propionate was there, they actually grow better, but which means that uh, acetate is not really, they partially inhibited, not fully inhibited when they have a mutant. They're still able to grow. Their growth is very similar to PA01, so which means a PA14 uh, mutant is still able to grow. They're not really dysfunctioning uh, pseudomonas. So my plan is that I pack the rabbits in the first day very tightly in the middle meters, and then I inject a B. fragilis right here inside, directly into the maxillary sinus without going through the nose. And then because I did the enterobacterial inoculation first, about day four, I inoculated pseudomonas afterwards. And at day 10, I actually did the CT scan, see how much sinusitis they develop, and I removed the packing. The reason is the rabbit will die if I don't remove packing in day, uh, at, at two, within two weeks because they're so stressed out. And for those rabbits, we divided two groups. One is acute and chronic, and see whether there's a difference between sinus potential difference measurement and also the histology. So here's what I do. So I, I able to collect the mucus from the beginning. So now I'm setting a pro, uh, proteomics of these uh, in fact, uh, this mu uh, mucus. So to here is the rabbit's middle turbinate here. As so I pack really tightly because make sure they have a hypoxic cavity at the same time. Not a lot of mucus have come out. So I put the one and two marrow cells, like synthetic spun into the middle meatus around the, around the middle turbinates. And then afterwards, my research tech found this hole. I called a Daniel, his name is Daniel Skinner, Skinner's foramen. So I able to inject this, the bacteria directly into the rabbit sinus without going into the nasal cavity. Uh, and then while he was injecting after put those two packing very tightly, and then um, I, uh, using the needle and then actually when the ten, usually use a 10 to the six of bacteria counts and we put it in. And then uh, we actually able to put it in directly. Now, I also, when he was injecting it, I looking at the scope, make sure that the needle doesn't bypass the sinus and going to nasal cavity. Sometimes if bacteria go all the way to nasal cavity, then there's nothing seeing the sinus. That's really bad. So I directly inject like that. And while he's injecting it, I'm looking at the nasal uh, scope, make sure that everything's are well injected directly into the sinus cavity. And this is day 10 of CT scan. So Y axis is the uh, full pacification. And uh, 10 is full pacification, and zero is there's no sinusitis. So some already mentioned about this uh, grading system or rabbit, so I don't have to val validate this, scale, uh, this scoring system. So you see that I only use the rabbits with the all opacified on the unilateral side. So there's sometimes there's not fully opacified. So I wanted to avoid one variable, the hypoxic condition, so I'm trying to make every sinus are fully opacified. And these rabbits are pretty stressed out. So when you're looking at this, interestingly, when you don't, we just pack the nose without any bacteria, there's no weight gains. 
But these rabbits that keep on losing weight, they even call me, the animal like call me just like a patient pager that this, your rabbit's fighting each other. Your rabbit has the, uh, there's a weight, they don't eat anything, they don't poop well, so you have to come and do something. So there was a significant weight loss when it infected the wild type Pseudomonas with a B. fragilis compared to the nasal packing by itself. So rabbits really stretch, but this also tells you how people could suffer when you have acute sinus disease, especially with the Pseudomonas. When I look at the CFU count on day 10, there is a significant difference between, significant difference, but it was not, not huge, but there are some difference between the wild type PA14 versus mutant. So definitely there's a, a mutant pseudomonas demonstrated growth defect relative to the PA14 wild type. However, they're still able to grow uh, uh, pretty much pretty good. But bacteria is there's no difference among the co-culture group. However, bacteria is appears to grow a little bit better when they grow by itself instead of giving all the bacteria there. So the first was we actually outcome measurement with a chloride secretion. We, just, we were able to sinus potential difference measurement to see how much chloride is coming out their sinus cavities. And we noted there's a significant difference between the two groups because of the sinus potential difference measurement was significantly different between the two groups. So there's a wild type that the wild type uh, actually more defected in the chloride secretion comparing to the mutant groups. So, and then I measure the histology measurement, the lateral wall, the three different sites of the sinus cavities, make sure that everything is, uh, the mucosal thickness is okay. And first of all, I measure the epithelial height and the subepithelial height. Regarding the epithelial, epithelial height, there's not much difference between the wild type and the mutants. And also the submucosal uh, subepithelial height, also there's not much difference between the two groups. However, when you see that their density is very different, with the wild type, there's significant inflammatory cells, but in the mutant student, the subepithelial, there's not much going on. So when I go to the chronic conditions, day 42, when I look at the chloride secretion, there's still a very significant difference between this mutant and the wild type. And then when I compare this to acute and chronic, there are also very significant difference between the chloride secretions between these uh, two, uh, two groups, which means that once there's an acute injury of a chloride defect, it doesn't really recover when you're day 42, even though your aeration was restored. So sinus potential difference revealed greater chloride transport in the mutant comparing to the wild type in both acute and chronic rabbits. And when I look at the histology here, the chronic, there's a significant difference between the chronic conditions, between the wild type versus mutant pseudomonas. And the epithelial thickness is, is somehow different. However, there's no difference between the groups in, at chronic condition between the wild type as uh, with the mutant. Uh, and then there's a, a increased epithelial thickness in the both chronic rabbits comparing to their acute counterpart. But the major significant difference is subepithelial layers. So there's a significant high in the rabbits when infected wild type, there's submucosal layer. So a lot of happening in these rabbits submucosal layer, not in the epithelial layer. And increased thickness at day 42 was only, uh, was the only uh, notice in these wild type groups. It's just, uh, the mutant type group, there's not much difference subepithelial epithelial layer between the uh, acute and the chronic. So next, next step, what I'm doing is this uh, last two slides, but I'm just understanding why this is happening at, at this point. And then trying to invasion, it looks like that there's uh, epithelial, there's like pseudomonas, uh, like pseudomonas, there's some evidence like markers in the subepithelial cells. I'm trying to stain the pseudomonas in using the inside hybridation because fluorescence is like very difficult because there are a lot of autofluorescent. We're, we're able to see there are more pseudomonas signals in the sub subepithelial layers. And to understand this next step, I tried to, uh, once I did the, one time I just did the, the pseudomonas, so I sculptured the pseudomonas of these rabbits and actually uh, see their action with the rabbit primary neutrophil, which is a healthy. When you see here that rabbit's able to eat the pseudomonas very, uh, this pseudomonas is coming from the mutant pseudomonas, and this neutrophil able to eat this finally, they fight each other finally. But when we're looking at right here in this slide, there's a wild type uh, PA14 was grown in, uh, from these rabbits. And you see that finally they were getting into the neutrophils. It's finally getting in and in. What happened is that what's in, and that the pseudomonas all of a sudden, and actually I thought it was already done, but when you watch closely, the pseudomonas are coming out from the other side of the pseudomonas. And they're actually coming through it, so actually they actually bypass the pseudomonas uh, neutrophil, but it's coming out right now. It's coming out from the neutrophils. 
So there may be something going on with the virulence of pseudomonas when they're able to met, uh, metabolize the acetate and propionate. So a conclusion is that after date 10 of hypoxia with inoculation of two bacteria, there were significant weight loss and dysfunctional chloride secretions were noticed, worsening those rabbit infected wild type. And even the restoration of sinus oxygenation, those sinus infective anaerobically grown wild uh, PA14 developed significant tissue inflammation and decreased chloride secretions. And also this function of chloride secretion did not improve at a chronic stage with restoration and uh, sinus oxygenations. And tissue inflammation appears to be more happening more in the subepithelia than epithelial layers. And we think that virulent pseudomonas could be related to transient hypoxic growth condition and the metabolism of acetate and propionate. I want to thank you to uh, my collaborators and my mentors, especially my um, microbiologist at UAB, Dr. Soares and Megan, and I really appreciate your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would encourage everybody with, for their questions to put it in the uh, Q&A as we go along. Yes, we have one, oh, I'm sorry. We have one question from Fabrice Jean-Pierre. Um, and the question is, are there any alternative propionate and acetate utilization path pathways in Pseudomonas aeruginosa that could explain why there, there's still persistence of Pseudomonas in rabbit sinuses? Yes, um, yeah, I mean, I think the rabbit used several different pathways to um, glucose metabolism in several ways. I think the three or four different pathways, and the, uh, what they're using in acetate propionate is one of the pathways they're able to utilize it. So um, the reason I put the bacteroidus is trying to give you more of the, those acetate propionate, uh, those short-chain fatty acid there, and that we didn't block the butyrate, so which means that they're still able to use the butyrate in this model and they're able to produce and they're able to survive. Question from Katie, he said, uh, what channels contribute to chloride secretion? Dr. Jamie Hook at Sinai sees uh, squared CFTR deficiency in the lung during acute lung infection. So what channels contribute to chloride secretion? Oh, yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, we're trying to also to figure out LPS injury. We, we do have some, a lot of models about the I know that that's something a little different story that, but we, we do a lot of chronic, uh, we recently published a redox cycle about LPS, uh, acute injury can cause the chloride, uh, chloride defect. So we've seen a lot of injuries that are using the acute exposure of LPS and then also this type of the inflammation infections that also decrease a lot of chloride defect. Also the even hypoxia about redox, uh, also mechanism can also decrease the chloride uh, secretions. Yes. I, ha I had a question. Um, there's been a lot of work trying to uh, establish what the nutritional landscape in the lower respiratory tract, in the sputum, et cetera. Um, has that there been done similar work in the sinus uh, cavity? And, and what is that uh, nutritional or other chemical environment that might modulate how pseudomonas behaves? Oh, OK. That's, thank you for your question. Um, well, the uh, sinus, uh, sinus researcher always follow the lungs long research. So uh, based on our finding, it's probably, I don't think there's not much to study about the, Ryan Hunter's group study a lot about pseudomonas uh, nutrition in terms of the uh, pseudomonas, uh, pseudomonas, pseudomonas sinusitis and staph also infections. We also think that the, uh, a lot of uh, carbon sources, that's one of the, the major causes uh, of these infections. And I think the major carbon sauce is causing from the mucus, so the mucus fermentation, and not only for acetate propionate, but also like lactate. And the other, uh, a, lot of the, a lot of inflammatory, also the metabolites coming from, I think those actually also changes based on the environment, humidity and also nitric oxide levels. Everything changes. I think that also really vary depending on which bacteria grow in the sinuses. So I think that really, yeah, that's a very good question. We're trying to explore some of the things very unique for the sinus cavities. Yes. And what about peptides and amino acids in the sinus cavity? Uh, well, as far as I know, I don't have a lot of information there, but I think that's a very good uh, thing. I recently talked about like, amino acids there, but that's a very good talk. I really went to the, recently went to the anaerobic society meeting, and they also talk about a lot of amino acids in these those mucus there. So that's be another or another topic we want to explore. <laughs> another topic I really explore about bio acid. They recently noticed a lot of bio acid proteins are noticed in the sinus cavities. They might be cause a little culprit for the sinus diseases. Yes. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
question from Megan. Have you looked at, at, at what immune cells populations are recruited to the sinus with Pseudomonas Y-type and mutants, or with the, uh, when the anaerobes are present? Yes, that's a good question. So in the acute model, when I look at the earlier model, it's more neutrophils, uh, so most acute group. And the, uh, in the chronic stage, it's like after six weeks, there are mostly a lot of plasma cells, uh, and which means also there are uh, plasma cells, so plus there's lymphocytes. And interestingly, there's also a lot of neutrophils at the same time. So it's more of a mixed picture at the chronic stage, and also the acute stage is more of a neutrophils. Thank you so much, Dr. Cho. Thank you. And And moving forward with our section, I would like to invite uh, Gretchen Bowler from uh, University of uh, Alabama in Birmingham, which is going to tell us about the small colony variant pathogenesis uh, in, in the red CF model. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you for that introduction. Let's see if we can get the laser pointer on here. Okay. Excellent. Um, so this is the work that I have been doing in the lab of Dr. Susan Burkett at the University of Alabama at Birmingham for my PhD. And I have nothing to disclose for this talk. One of the hallmarks of CF disease is chronic and recurrent infection with a broad range of pathogens over a person's lifetime. As you can see here, there are many pathogens that infect the CF airway, but Staphylococcus aureus, shown here in green, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa, shown in blue, are the two most common pathogens, with Staph being currently the most prevalent. Now, we are beginning to more understand more about the infection pathology of bacteria such as Pseudomonas aeruginosa. However, there's still relatively little that we understand about staph infections. And one of the reasons behind this is that there's a high range of genetic variability among infectious strains of Staphylococcus aureus. So even within a single patient, several subtypes of staph may be co-infecting at once, confounding that pathology. One of the things that we see in the clinic that is arising more in people with CF is a subtype of staph called small colony variants, or SCVs. SCVs derive their name because they typically present with about 10 times smaller colony size than normal colony variants, or NCVs, on a plate. However, SCVs are also phenotypically different from NCVs in a number of other ways, including reduced hemolysis on blood auger, typically an altered pigmentation, and nutrient oxytrophies, or the reliance on exogenous sources for key metabolites, including typically menadione, hemin, or thymidine. Now, these metabolites sort SCVs into two different categories um, of deficient strains, either electron transport deficient SCVs in the context of menadione and hemin oxytrophs, or DNA synthesis deficient oxytrophs um, in the case of thymidine. In either case, these mutations often will lead to antibiotic resistance as you're changing key metabol metabolomic processes that will change the way that the bacteria interacts with antibiotics. In the clinic, it, concerningly, we've seen that these SCVs have been associated with worse outcomes for people with CF. This includes a lower forced expiratory volume compared to percent predicted, but also lower partial pressure of arterial oxygen, higher antibiotic resistance, and a higher risk for pulmonary exacerbations. There's also a number of groups that are at higher risk for SCVs, including people with lower BMIs, older age, or prior antibiotic exposure. Additionally, we know that in vitro experiments have shown that SCVs can be generated from exposure both to antibiotics and also co-infection with Pseudomonas aeruginosa, uh, which is concerning because there is a large overlap between these two pathogens in the CF airway. It is not uncommon for a, CF, a person with CF to have both of these pathogens at a single time, indicating that there may be some interaction happening in the lung itself as well. Now, what we don't understand yet about this is whether SCVs are actually driving this lung decline that we see in these patients, or if they are simply a factor of late-stage CF disease. And that's what we set out to do with this study. We wanted to determine whether SCVs were actually driving this lung decline, and we hypothesized that SCV staph respiratory infections will cause worse host outcomes than NCV infections in the context specifically of CF lung disease. Now, in order to do this, we first needed a viable SCV strain. And so what we chose to do was to generate a SCV mutant from a NCV strain in order to directly compare the two. We took an isolate from a patient at the UAB hospital who was co-infected with Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And that's the strain you can see on the left, SA0831. We then passaged repeatedly with the drug tobramycin, which is an antibiotic that is typically treated as an inhaled therapy for 30 days um, for Pseudomonas aeruginosa. 
And this would replicate a context in which both of these pathogens would be co-infecting the lung, a patient would be receiving tobermycin, and that tobermycin would then come into contact with the staph. When we did this in vitro, we did 10 passages, and we found that it caused a stable colony formation of SCVs. So this SCV was stable out to five passages on mannitol salt auger, indicating that it is maintaining that SCV phenotype. There are a number of additional tests that we also ran to make sure that we were dealing with an SCV here. So we tested hemolysis by streaking these isolates on um, blood auger, and we found that there was a reduced hemolytic profile compared to the normal colony strain. Additionally, we measured growth in liquid culture in brain heart infusion media, and we found that here in blue, this SCV it took a longer time to reach exponential growth and also reached a lower optical density overall, indicating a stunted growth profile in liquid media. Finally, we measured oxytrophy for one of the three main metabolites, hemin, menadione, or thymidine. And in this assay, we struck a plate with the bacteria and added a paper disc including one of these three metabolites. And we found that for menadione, this was able to restore the growth of the SCV back to what we would expect for the NCV strain at 24 hours. And this indicated to us that we were dealing with a menadione oxytrophic strain. We also did some genetic testing to confirm what we were seeing for SCVs and to maybe parse out what could be the cause of this menadione oxytrophy. And we found that this gene, arrow A1, is mutated in our SCV strain. Now this is important because SIO831 SCV has this uh, mutation that then leads to the synthesis of charismate, which is a key intermediate that plays into a number of metabolic pathways, including menaquinone biosynthesis. This can be the cause of menadione oxytrophy. We also find that this is notable because many of the SCVs that are being studied, studied in in vitro and in vivo tests are full knockouts of menadione genes within this pathway. So this indicates to us that there may be off-target effects of this mutation that further replicate what we might expect from an isolate from a person with CF and not just a full knockout of a gene. Before we moved on to our in vivo experiments, the last thing that we wanted to do was to test antibiotic resistance of the strain. So we tested against two drugs. We tested against tobermycin, the drug that we passaged with to obtain the SCV phenotype. And we also tested with SXT, or sulfamethoxazole trimethoprim, which is a combo drug that is given to treat staph infections specifically. And what we found was that our NCV strain was fully susceptible to tobermycin, and had some susceptibility to sulfamethoxazole trimethoprim. However, when we look at our SCV strain here on the bottom, you can see in this blue line that the growth perfectly matches without drug for tobermycin, indicating that this strain is resistant to toby. However, when we look at SXT, we see that at time points past five hours, it appears that susceptibility uh, may be a little bit lower in the context of SXT, indicating that the strain may have increased tolerance of this drug. But to parse this out further, we wanted to make sure that this was occurring at different concentrations as well. So for this assay, we took um, these growth curves that you see here on the left, and we performed that at different concentrations, ranging from 1.875 all the way out to 240 micrograms per milliliter of this SXT drug. And then we compared the growth at the maximum optical density to what it would be without any drug at all. And what we found was at lower concentrations, exactly what we expected. This NCV strain was able to grow to a better extent than our SCV. However, at higher concentrations of the drug, this trend does reverse, and we see that the SCV grows to a greater extent than the NCV strain. And this indicated to us that some increased tolerance may be happening for our uh, SCV strain. And this is significant because we, again, we're passaging with a drug targeted for Pseudomonas, and now we have a little bit more uh, tolerance of a drug for staph, which may be a complication in the clinic as well. With all of this under our belt, however, we wanted to move forward with in vivo experiments. And for this, we chose to use the CFTR knockout rat, which is a novel rat model that was developed in our lab and fully replicates uh, aspects of CF disease, including the mucus de defect phenotype. We installed intratracheally 10 to the 9th CFUs of either the NCV or SCV strain, and we allowed these infections to persist for three full days. At the end of three days, we did two things. The first, we collected the bronchial alveolar lavage fluid from these animals, and we used this to assess the cell populations within the lung, um, both by differential cell staining, and then we also evaluated the inflammatory cytokines that were present in the lung uh, via ELISA of this valve. Additionally, we harvested the lung tissue from these animals, and we used it to determine the amount of bacteria that were present in the lung via colony-forming units, and we also stained this tissue with hematoxylin and eosin to evaluate any inflammation that may be occurring. 
And what we found at three days, for both our wild type and CF animals, we were able to retrieve a similar amount of bacteria from NCV and SCV infections. And this indicated to us that these SCVs were equally able to persist. So even though they have a stunted growth profile in vitro, they're equally able to survive within the lung. However, when we look at the weight of these animals, as you can see on, in red for our wild type and CF animals, is that the SCV infected animals lost a greater proportion of their initial body weight and maintained a lower weight over the course of the study, indicating more severe complications from disease. Additionally, when we looked at inflammation in the tissue, we saw differences between NCV and SCV infection. We found that with SCV infection, these dense purple patches of inflammation were indicating a high con concentration of specifically neutrophils when we look in at the tissue. What we found here as well was that there was a population of macrophages that were present with NCV CF infections that were not present in SCV CF infections, indicating that there may be a CF specific difference here with immune detection of SCVs as well. When we looked at this in the BALF, we found largely the same uh, results. We found that neutrophils were significantly increased in the bronchial alveolar lavage with SCV infection in both wild type and CF animals. And we again found that only in the context of CF were macrophages depleted. Finally, we looked at the cytokines that may be driving this inflammation. And we looked at TNF alpha, IL-1 beta, IL-6, and IL-10 in both our wild type and CF animals. And what we found both for TNF-alpha and IL-1 beta was that no differences arise in either animal model with our SCV infection. We did see in our CF animals a significant decrease in IL-6 specifically with SCV infection, um, which again may play into that macrophage detection issue as it may be an activator of the macrophages that are present. But of course, we need to look into that further to say anything conclusive. And finally, we looked at IL-10, and we did see a small change, but only in our wild-type animals, which indicated to us that this may not be sufficient to be driving that inflammation either. So the takeaway from this is that uh, we still don't know what cytokine could be driving this or if there's an effector uh, molecule that we haven't looked at yet, but it is independent of these common cytokines. So overall, this body of work showed that we were able to serially passage the clinical isolate SA0831, which is a MRSA isolate from a patient at UAB, with anti-pseudomonas tobramycin. Um, and this led to the generation of the SCV mutant SA0831 SCV, which was a menadione oxytroph and had all of the characteristics of what an SCV looks like. Additionally, when we put these SCVs into the animal lung, we found that they were equally able to persist. However, they caused greater weight loss and inflammation at three days post-infection in an acute infection time period. Now, there's a number of things that still need to be flushed out about this work. And the first is to investigate these host outcomes at time points modeling chronic infection. People with CF are not suffering specifically with acute infection. Um, they're dealing with chronic infections that last a lot longer. And so we want to next look at how these infection dynamics change as the course of infection persists to a longer time point. Additionally, we want to derive SCVs from additional isolates and compare the infectious outcomes to make sure that this is not a one-off effect for a single clinical isolate. We also want to investigate macrophage-specific SCV response and additional inflammatory mediators that may be driving inflammation here. Um, we also find that it may be interesting to look at the activation states of those macrophages as well that we see specifically um, with NCV infection and CF, but not with SCV infection. And finally, we want to evaluate the rate at which SCVs revert to NCVs and how this relates to disease progression. So one of the things that is complicated about SCVs is that we often find them reverting to an NCV phenotype after isolation back out of a patient. And we would like to know if this is occurring within the lung as well and whether or not that allows SCVs to stick around longer in the context of CF disease. And with that, I would like to thank the members of my lab and my committee at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, our funding sources, and I would be more than happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Gretchen. Actually, to start off the Q&A, I have a question for you. Okay. It's more curiosity. Um, are, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm still learning how to use microphone, sorry. <laughs> Um, the appearance of the SCV are 
um, happening only on when you pass a on tobramycin, or it happens with any other antibiotic? It it's, it maintains that. So the question being does, whether the SCVs only show up that way if they're in the presence of the drug, mm -hmm. right? So these SCVs, once they've been passaged um, with this tobramycin drug, we can take them back off of that tobramycin exposure, and they're maintaining that phenotype. So we've just played them on plain mannitol salt auger, which is pretty standard for Staphylococcus aureus, mm -hmm. but we've also done um, LB and a number of other med standard medias, and we see that it does maintain all of the same phenotype um, as it would in the presence of the drug. But for the emergence of this phenotype, sure. Uh, it happens only in tobramycin, but if I use in like... No, so yeah, okay, so is it only tobramycin that's causing this, right? Okay. So this moves into the dynamics of SCVs as a whole. Um, and if you recall, there are three categories of the he human menadione and thymidine oxytrophic uh, strains. And so human menadione have been more associated with this tobramycin and other aminoglycosides like it. Um, but there's also the entire field of these thymidine deficient um, strains, and these are more associated with staph drugs like sulfamethoxazole trimethoprim. So there are different um, SCV genres, I suppose, um, but not a lot of work has compared what the pathology of a uh, menadione oxytroph would be to a thymidine oxytroph. And that is something that we want to look at, um, something that we have in the works as well. Thank mm -hmm. There's a question. Uh, a few questions from the audience. Uh, first, can you speculate on the difference in macrophage? Do you think that it's the result of increased neutrophils, death of macrophage, or a lack of recruitment? So that's an interesting question. Um, and we think that it may play into a bigger question of immune evasion, so lack of recruitment. Um, and specifically, that's because we saw these pockets of neutrophils or of macrophages, sorry, um, that we just didn't see with those SCV infections. So we did see those congregations, and we do know that SCVs um, in other tissue types can persist intracellularly, and so it may be that they are using that to their advantage and hiding from uh, those macrophages. But we obviously need to do more before we can say that for sure. Um, there's another question. Uh, are the SCV revertins have tobramycin sensitivity back to regular NCVs? That is an interesting question, and that is not something that we have looked at. So we haven't taken any of those isolates that we've recovered back out of these infections and tested, um, but I would assume they still would, considering that they maintain, um, if they're maintaining an SCV phenotype. But again, that's not something that we've tested. In the clinic, though, um, we do see that there is um, antibiotic resistance in those SCVs that are coming back out. Um, another comment and question. Nice work. Do you have any idea how specific to the particular autotroph you tested these responses are? Um, how, how specific to, so, oh, so again, playing, in, yeah, so playing into the question um, of whether or not the menadione oxytroph is going to be the same as, a th again, I don't think there's enough data to really say that for sure yet, um, but we'll see. Do you have plans of testing other mutants that you're yes, generating? Yes, yes. So I have um, just finished passaging a SXT-driven um, strain, so we'll see what that looks like, too. Great talk. Where is the glucose that is not being shunted into menaquinone synthesis going in the SCV? That is a fascinating question. Um, I don't think that I'm in the right place to answer that one, but... Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know how that would play into airway physiology as a whole, but that would be a really interesting thing to look at. Um, did you check the phenotype after infection? I guess that's... Yes, okay. yes. So this is something that is actually part of our manuscript. Actually, this manuscript came out about a week ago in Infection and Immunity, and we just didn't have time to talk about it in this talk here. But we did see that in those recovered isolates, um, we tested for phenotype based on size... Um, blood, like hemolysis on blood auger, most of the tests that we ran here. And we did find that there was a mixed population of NCVs and SCVs pulled back out from these infections. So there was capability to revert here. So, so what you're saying is you, you, were, you ended up with mixed populations. Yes. yes, and we find that to be an advantage um, of the strain. What we cannot look at in these genetic knockouts of genes causing SCVs. Um, we do know that SCVs coming out of patients in the clinic do have reversion capabilities, and so we hope that that better models what may be going on in CF as well. Is there a difference in the SCV, uh, the neutrophil clearance of SCVs versus wild-type strains? I don't know that that has been extensively studied. 
I mean, it would be something that is interesting to look at. Um, again, SCVs and other tissue types have been associated with immune evasion, but nothing specifically in the lung yet that I can have seen in the literature. And I was curious, you were mentioning at the end that you were planning to look at longer time points. Yes. Um, with your current model, have you started at all looking past the We've first few days? We've started, um, but I'm not at a place where I can fully assess that data. Um, it's still very preliminary. Um, but I can tell you what we expect, and that is that we expect the infection dynamics to shift a bit, um, to be looking at more, uh, less of the immediate immune uh, cell response with the heavy neutrophilia and be looking more at um, inflammation near the smaller airways. But again, um, that's just conjecture. We need to actually look at the data first. Great. If, are there any other questions? No. Well, with that, thank you very thank much. You. Welcome our next speaker, Dr. Heisert, who is uh, an assistant professor at National Jewish, who's going to talk to us about macrophage and um, non tuberculous mycobacteria. Right. So, let's see where am I? I'm here. And I also think I need the pointer, so we'll see if I can get my pointer going here. Um, need the pointer. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, so for those of you who know me, well, first I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak. I really appreciate this opportunity. And for those of you who know me, you know I've been studying macrophages for a while. This is an entirely new project. My lab started when I moved to National Jewish Health. I've joined the dark side, as I say. I've gone over to non-tuberculous mycobacteria, and I'm really excited to share these data with you today. These are my disclosures. So non-tuberculous mycobacteria, I think a lot of people are familiar, but what are these? These are the mycobacteria that are not tuberculosis and not leprosy. And unlike those two species, non-tuberculous mycobacteria can exist in the environment outside of a human host. They can exist in fresh water, they can exist in soil, they might be in the pipes of your house, you might have been exposed this morning when you were taking a shower, but don't fear, most of us cannot get infection with these organisms. They're considered opportunistic pathogens. They don't cause disease in healthy people. However, we do know that they can cause disease in a subset of individuals, so particularly immunocompromised people, but also people who have chronic airways disease. And so people with CF are at a much higher risk of developing pulmonary NTM infections than the general population, and this prevalence is increasing. If you look at the CF registry, about 10 to 20% of people with CF have NTM positive sputum. And so this may be colonization, but in some people this progresses to true pulmonary infection. And we know that pulmonary infection has worse outcomes. But we don't just pull the trigger and treat these immediately because treatment, in fact, is really difficult and we have to be sure that it's worth treating the patients. Therapies to treat uh, pulmonary NTM, we're talking three to five antibiotics for weeks to months, if not over a year. And even with all this therapy, we often fail to eradicate the infection. So when we think about this, we have this growing problem that we're not that very good at treating, and we need to do better. And so I want to redirect us to this point about how people with CF are at an increased risk. And so this is CF. This is also non-CF bronchiectasis. And the truth is we don't fully understand why this population is at risk for these infections. And so what I would like to uh, uh, propose today is that a better understanding of why people with CF are susceptible to pulmonary NTM infections is essential both for developing novel strategies for combating these infections, but also predicting which individuals are at highest risk for developing them. So when we're interested in my lab is what happens when that initial interaction happens between the bacteria and the host? So in a healthy person, as I mentioned, not a lot. We think, really, your body doesn't even let you know that you're infected. We think that there's two ma major mechanisms that prevent you from getting sick. You have your uh, epithelial cells with the mucociliary transport, and we think that's your primary line of defense, and that brushes out most of the bacteria. However, some of the bacteria may get through, and if it ends up in the distal lungs, you have these lovely macrophages. These are the resident alveolar macrophages. And it is thought that these cells are just exceptionally good at recognizing, ingesting, and destroying the bacteria without causing an inflammatory response. Okay, so what if you have CF and bronchiectasis? Well, by definition, if you have bronchiectasis, you have damage in your airway. And we also know in CF in particular, your mucociliary apparatus is, is not working very well. So your first line of defense is broken. But this bacteria, which would 
otherwise go to the distal lung can't do that in CF because you have copious mucus blocking the airway. So now you have the NTM lodged in your small airway. And there's actually a pretty good body of literature right now that the cells that go to these small airways to fight infection are recruited from the bloodstream. They're not recruited from the distal lung. So you're getting neutrophils and you're getting monocyte-derived macrophages showing up to fight this infection. So now you have this dichotomy between healthy people and people with CF in terms of the macrophages. And the resident recruited cells are different, not only in their origin, but also in the maturation factors they're exposed to, or the colony stimulating factors. Resident airspace macrophages are unique in the human body in that homeostasis, they are matured and bathed in high levels of the cytokine GMCSF, or granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor. This is in contrast to pretty much every other macrophage in the body, and the macrophages coming out of the blood, blood is a compartment with low GMCSF, are primarily matured in MCSF, or monocyte colony stimulating factor. So this led my lab to ask a basic question. Does exposure to high levels of GMCSF increase macrophage ability to kill NTM? And for the experiments I'm showing you, we're using m -abscessus. This is the ATCC strain 19977. Um, we plan to follow this up with clinical isolates and also with mycobacterium avium. So it's a pretty straightforward experiment. We take healthy donor blood, we isolate the monocytes, and we mature them to monocyte-derived macrophages over six days with MCSF, which is the standard protocol for making MDMs. But then we tweak the protocol. For the final 24 hours, we changed the media to have different concentrations of GMCSF. Some cells got no GMCSF. Some got 5 picograms per mil, which is what's approximated in plasma. Some got 500 picograms per mil, which is what's estimated to be in the alveoli. And some got 50 nanograms per mil, which is a sledgehammer, but it's what's often used when people do in vitro experiments. 24 hours later, we infected the macrophages with Mycobacterium obsessus, and then we determined colony forming units at one hour, which I'm calling time zero, and at four days later. And what I'm going to show you is the proportion of bacteria that remained after four days. So what we found was when there was no GMCSF or low levels of GMCSF, not only did the macrophage not kill the bacteria, but there was actually growth of the bacteria in the macrophages. But at these higher levels of GMCSF, the macrophages were turned into nice little killing machines. So this led us to several hypotheses. The first was that GMCSF activates macrophages for effective NTM killing. And the second is that insufficient GMCSF signaling contributes to susceptibility to NTM infections. Now some of you may be thinking the second hypothesis isn't entirely novel, and you're correct. There's actually been a number of case reports, both in CF patients with m -obsessus, using nebulized GMCSF, but also going back to people with advanced AIDS and systemic NTM infections of using GMCSF to try to treat these infections. In addition, Marianne de Groot and colleagues proposed the GMCSF knockout mouse to be a model of chronic NTM infection. Wild type mouse will readily clear the infection. And if you want to test antimicrobials in a mouse, you need to come up with a chronic model. So this was shown that GMCSF was necessary for that rapid clearance. However, despite these uh, reports, the mechanisms by which GMCSF enhances host defense to help protect against NTM in healthy lungs remains unknown. So going back to our hypothesis, we tweaked the second one to say that insufficient GMCSF signaling at the level of the macrophage is important for resistance to NTM. And bringing it all together to think about why people with CF are susceptible, we are hypothesizing that macrophages recruited to the airways are not exposed to sufficient GMCSF to eradicate the invading inhaled NTM, thus increasing the chance that NTM infections will become established in people with CF and bronchiectasis. And so we're studying this in a number of different ways in both human and, and mouse models. And today I'm going to talk about the mouse models. And we're looking at a, several mouse models. The first one I'm going to talk about is going back to that GMCSF mouse, but also comparing it to the wild-type mouse. And I don't have time to show you all this data today, but I would like to propose today that the wild-type mouse is actually a very good model of studying M. obsessus infection, because I think it actually probably approximates what's happening in healthy humans. You can put millions of bacteria in the lungs of this mouse, and it won't lose weight. There'll be a very modest neutrophilic recruitment, something like 30 to 50 percent, and the animal will clear the entire infection in a couple of weeks, which is probably what happens when we inhale a lot of mycobacteria. And that's in stark contrast to the GMCSF knockout mouse that becomes chronically infected. And so what we thought was, let's look really early in these infections, see what the immune response is doing, and that can help us understand the difference between susceptibility and resistance into these two mouse strains. <laughs> 
So the first data I'm going to show you is just that we can replicate what Marianne DeGroote and colleagues showed, which is that the GMCSF mock-out mice are highly susceptible to lung infection as measured by colony-forming units in the lung. So you have colony-forming units on the y-axis, and in the navy bars, that's the wild-type mice, and you can see that at six days after infection, there's more than a log of bacteria that's been cleared, and the BAL is essentially sterile. However, in the GMCSF knockout mice, you can see there's been growth of bacteria in the lungs, and the BAL is still full of lots of bacteria. So what we were interested in is what's happening with the immune cells, and what's the interaction with the pathogen. So we did... BAL on the mice, we took the BAL fluid, we did cytospins, and we stained it with modified Kenyan stain that detects acid fast bacilli. So what I'm going to show you first is the wild-type mice. At day three, you can see it's mostly macrophages. There's, again, a modest neutrophilic infiltration. And you can find copious macrophages on the slide that, have, or that are AFB positive. Some, like these two, have only one or two bacteria. But you can find a bunch of macrophages that are just chock full of bacteria. In contrast, at day six, you have to search the entire slide to find the few macrophages that are AFB positive, and when you find them, there's only one or two bacteria per cell. This, to me, is absolutely fascinating. What is happening in three days that you're having such a difference in the amount of macrophages infected and how much macro bacteria per macrophage? You can imagine the macrophages could be killing the bacteria, the macrophages could be leaving the lung and going somewhere else, or the macrophages maybe are dying and taking the bacteria with them. So these are all possibilities that we're investigating to understand how a healthy lung deals with emipsis. Now the GMCSF knockout mouse were very different. You can see at day three, it's not very different from the wild type mouse. There's a lot of macrophages that have a lot of bacteria. But in contrast at day six, and again, the differential here is not that different. It's still about only 50% neutrophils. But all of these cells, both macrophages and neutrophils, a lot of them are filled with bacteria. And so something has changed in this animal. In the absence of GMCSF, the macrophages are not doing something. And so we want to figure out exactly which cells are responding to GMCSF to have this effect. And so moving forward, we're going to try to identify those cells in a couple of different ways. The first is we're selectively eliminating the GMCSF receptor on different macrophage populations. We have the CSF2RB flox mouse, which is the GMCSF receptor beta chain, and we're breeding those mice with mice that we can inducibly delete the receptor either on recruited macrophages or on resident macrophages. And what I anticipate is that in the mice that are lacking the receptor on recruited macrophages, I don't think these mice are going to have a phenotype in terms of bacterial CFUs in the lung. These mice, I think, that you really only need those resident cells to destroy the bacteria. They might have a problem with resolution of inflammation, and they might have a problem if they have a second infection with NTM. But in terms of that initial infection, I think they'll be just fine with clearing the bacteria. In contrast, with the mice that are lacking the receptor on the uh, resident macrophages, I think these mice are going to initially get infected. Those macrophages will not be able to deal with the infection. However, then you have the recruited macrophages come into that GMCSF-rich environment of the alveoli. And what I showed you with human cells is it doesn't take that long for those cells to take on a killer phenotype. So I think these mice will have a delayed resolution of infection with an intermediate phenotype between the wild-type and the GMCSF knockout mice. We're also going to infect wild-type mice with m cherry expressing m abscessus or red fluorescent bacteria. And we can use flow cytometry to determine if resident or recruited macrophages are ingesting the bacteria. And we can also sort the macrophages, to the ones that have no bacteria, the ones that have a few bacteria, and the ones that are chock full of bacteria, and use transcriptomics to ask how are these cells different. So this is another picture from a day three cytospin from a wild-type mouse. And I really want to know, these two macrophages look morphologically the same. Why is this one different from this one? They're literally sitting next to each other on the field, and yet one is full of bacteria and one is empty. This heterogeneity of host pathogen response within a healthy host has been described with a number of bacteria now. And I think understanding heterogeneity will really help us understand resistance and susceptibility to disease. All right, in my few remaining minutes, I want to turn to the final point, which is does location of pulmonary infection alter the immune response? And this is the question of the airway infection versus the alveolar infection. And to investigate this, we're going to use the auger bead model, which I think a number of here, people are here are familiar with. It's been around for several decades. It's a way of taking bacteria that don't cause a chronic infection in a small animal and make it more of a chronic infection 
And this was first published with M. Obsessus in 2020, and I'll just point out that our next speaker is one of the authors on this paper, so <laughs> exciting to hear you talk. Um, this is not an easy method for those of you who've been working on it, you know this, it's more of an art than a science to make the beads of the right size. And so I need to give a shout out to Dr. Ken Malcolm at National Jewish Health, who had perfected the method before I arrived there, but was eager to collaborate on this project. For those of you less familiar with the method, why is this such a big deal? Well, you need to make beads of the exact size. So you're putting live bacteria into molten auger, you end up with beads of all different sizes. You only want the ones that are 100 to 200 microns in diameter for mice. These have been shown to reliably lodge in small airways. And that's in contrast to the type of infection I've been showing you so far that I'm now calling planktonic infection, stealing a term from the biofilm community, which are free swimming individual bacteria which get inhaled into the distal lung or the alveoli. If we go back to my model of the lung from earlier, what I'm proposing is that the reason that the auger bead model becomes a chronic infection is you're forcing the infection into a different part of the lung. And what I'm expecting to see is that the auger bead model will recruit cells from the blood versus the planktonic infection, which will be taken care of by the resonant cells. This is what a bead model looks like with AFB in a mouse. So this is a Kenyan stain. And to orient you, you have a couple of blood vessels. You have alveoli that are inflamed. You have two airways here that are not impacted with beads because you don't want to asphyxia the mouse entirely. You need to leave some airways open. And then you have two airways in the middle in which beads have lodged. This bead has popped out. But you can see down here, the bead's still present. And if you zoom in, you can see AFB in the bead. We've kind of sliced through like the top or the bottom of the bead. And this huge plug of inflammatory cells that have been recruited in six days into this airway with some heterogeneity of the cells. So we used immunofluorescence to identify what these cells are. This is a different section of a different lung with a patent airway and a clogged airway. The blue is DAPI, it's the nuclei of the cells. Green is Ly6G, which are our neutrophils. And red is CD68, which is a pan macrophage marker. So you can see both macrophages and neutrophils have been recruited into the airways, and we're in the process now of trying to show whether those macrophages are in fact recruited from the blood. So the next step with this model is to test the hypothesis that insufficient local GMCSF production during airway infection fails to activate recruited monocyte-derived macrophages to kill M. obsessus. So we're going to figure out if we can just drop GMCSF down the airway the same way they did in that European Respiratory Journal with people with CF and see if that can enhance the activity of the recruited cells to kill the bacteria that is in the airway. We also have the GMCSF reporter mouse, which we can use to measure GMCSF expression in the small airways during the small bead infection. All right, I know I've gone over, but in conclusion, I want to leave you with a few thoughts. Resident lung macrophages are unique in their exposure to high concentrations of GMCSF during homeostasis. And when you're using in vitro cell culture to evaluate functions of in vivo tissue resident cells, consider the spe tissue specific environment. Because what you're testing in vivo may not approximate what's actually happening. Testing in vitro might not approximate in vivo. Resident recruited macrophages likely mount differential antimicrobial programs when encountering pathogens due to their exposure to different CSFs. And finally, location matters. I think this is something that's been often overlooked, and in CF this is critically important because of where the disease occurs. Lung immune cells may have differential ability to eradicate inhaled pathogens depending on where they encounter the pathogen. So with that, I want to thank the people who did the work. Uh, Jody Corley and Alma Ochoa are here at the conference. They are currently in my lab. Jack Conjol is taking care of our mice back in Denver. Um, and all the people at National Jewish Health and CU Anschutz who help with the work. And with that, I will take questions. Oh, more slides. Thank you. The first question is, do the uh, knockout mice have any basal life phenotype before infection or difficulties cleaning, um, clearing other types of infections? Yeah, so the GMCSF knockout mouse, it's, it's fun to do the experiments and show the data, but when they don't have GMCSF, their resident airspay macrophages are defec defective, and they can't clear surfactant. So we have to use them when they're young, because they ultimately, as they age, they develop the human disease um, PAP, pulmonary alve alveolar proteinosis. So you very easily could say, I mean, their, their resident macrophages are messed up for other reasons, because they've been unable to 
perform their normal functions. So these mice are susceptible to other pathogens. Um, this is part of the reason I want to use the receptor, the inducible receptor knockouts, is then we don't have these same problems of wondering if there's other problems with the mice at baseline. Is, is there any way you can retrieve the agar beads after infection, potentially to look at the secreted metabolites or virulence factors by non-tuberculosis? Oh, that's a great question. So we've thought a lot about what to do with the beads. So it's interesting with the beads. It depends on the time point. The beads end up being degraded. So part of the question of why is the bead model a chronic model, some initial theories were that the auger acts either to protect the, the bacteria or it's a reservoir that the bacteria slowly leach out of. Depending on what organism you use, though, the beads get degraded very quickly or, or less quickly. So, you know, NT NTM, as I'm showing you, is kind of stealth. It doesn't cause a massive inflammatory response. There's not a lot of neutrophils. In our model, we see the beads at about day six, but by two weeks, they're mostly gone. So if you were interested in retrieving the beads to look at what's going on with the bacteria, you would need to look at a very early time point. Um, talking to my colleagues who use pseudomonas in beads or staph in beads, the beads are gone within a day or two because that's a massively neutrophilic, hyperinflammatory response. So um, we are... Thinking about, especially when we have our, our fluorescent bacteria, doing experiments to recover the bacteria and see what's changing in the bacteria. Um, most of what we're trying to do now is histopathology, and we could do RNA scope or things like that potentially. Next question is from Sebastian Riquelme. Nice talk. Any idea how GM CSF levels alter, alters the av availability of airway nutrients used by non tuberculosis mycobacteria to grow? Okay, sorry, can you repeat the question? <laughs> uh, any idea how the GMCSF levels out, out changes the availability of airway nutrients to use it by the bacteria to grow? I guess I need to understand the question more in terms of where in the lung and at, at what time during infection. Um, I think all of these things, like absolutely the metabolic state um, and the, the presence of different macromolecules in the lung will very much change both how the host cells respond and how the bacteria responds. Um, and this is actually, with NTM in particular, I think a really important question is at what point during the host pathogen interaction are you observing the interactions? Because it changes from that first initial and then over that first week, the chronic bead model goes out for us for seven weeks. And you can imagine that over that time period, it changes dramatically. The seven-week time point actually looks like human granulomas with, it looks like human disease, actually. Um, so, yeah, I'll, Sebastian, I'll talk with you more. I'll have to figure out exactly what, what time point and when you want to talk about. <laughs> There are two other uh, related questions. One was, uh, by knocking out GMCSF, do you, do you see any protonosis or soapy macrophage? Yes. And <laughs> do people with uh, PAP get NTM at a higher frequency? Yes, yeah, so people with PAP do get NTM at a higher frequency. Um, and that's, I mean, it's such a rare disease, but that is, it's, they were experts at it at National Jewish Health, and they actually, that was something they saw quite a bit of. Um, and yes, the macrophages, and actually if, we, if I went back at that day three cytospin, the macrophages, the resident airspace macrophages in the knockout do not look like normal resident airspace macrophages. They're very foamy. And to the, the earlier question's point, I recognize that these macrophages may be altered in other ways besides not just having GMCSF signaling. So this is where the receptor knockout mice are going to be critical because the knockout mice macrophages um, are probably abnormal in other ways. Yeah. Last question is, um, GMCSF also increases neutrophil lifespan. Is there any specific <laughs> neutrophil phenotype in the uh, um, knockout mice? Um, yeah, I'm not saying neutrophils are important. Um, we have not looked at the neutrophils. This has come up many times, and I apologize to neutrophils aficionados. Um, I think that... Um, this particular model and the idea of where in the airway and GMCSF, I think, you know, it would really depend on the organism. I think with NTM, with these initial inhalations, the neutrophils are less important. I have not pursued how, how neutrophils in the GMCSF knockout macrophage are different, but based on the way that NTM interacts, you know, this idea of what happens in a healthy lung, we inhale it, and there's almost no neutrophilic response. 
um, in a wild type mouse, same thing. Um, I'm sure GMCSF is acting on the neutrophils. I'm sure they're contributing, whether it's to resolution of inflammation, restoration of the alveolar environment. Um, but no, we have not characterized how the GMCSF knockout mouse neutrophilic response is different. We don't see a difference in the differential during infection. So we see the same numbers of neutrophils coming in in the knockout mouse as in the wild type. So. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Nicola Lore from IRCCS from Italy. And today he's going to talk more about the um, pathogenicity of non tuberculosis mycobacteria clinical isolates in, in different uh, CF relevant models. So, yeah, yeah thank you. So, um, before to start, I would like to thank the scientific committee to give me this opportunity to present uh, our work. Uh, and uh, I have to disclose just uh, uh, these two grants from the Italian Cystic Fibrosis. And uh, our work is focused uh, on uh, mycobacterium abscessus, in particular to characterize the pathogenicity of uh, clinical isolates uh, in different models, in epithelial cell models and in uh, mouse model of respiratory infection. As uh, already introduced uh, by uh, the previous speaker, uh, I mean, uh, among um, uh, non tubercular mycobacteria, we are uh, uh, interested in particular in the uh, rapid growing mic uh, mycobacteria, the Mycobacterium abscessus. And in CF, uh, it has been widely described that this bacteria can colonize uh, easily uh, this patient. In particular, in the context of cystic fibrosis, it has been uh, widely described that uh, more than 70% uh, of mycobacterium abscessus uh, infection are caused by genetically clustered isolates uh, called dom dominating circulating clones. And among these clones, in particular those called the dominating circulating clone one, uh, is uh, the one that is the most widespread. And uh, recently, uh, by our group, uh, it has been described that this uh, clone is also present in the Italian cystic fibrosis population. What is still unclear, uh, unclear is whether different dominating circulating clones may account for a different uh, pathogenicity. Again, in the context of uh, uh, Mycobacterium abscessus, uh, it is widely described that uh, the different morphotype, the smooth and the rough morphotype, uh, may account for a completely different pathogenicity. In particular, this model has been uh, described in macrophage through the activation of the toll like receptor 2 pathway. And uh, in the context of cystic fibrosis, less is known about the interaction of these two morphotypes in, in the uh, interaction uh, so with uh, the cystic fibrosis epithelial cells. And moreover, as you know better than me, in uh, the, uh, the uh, mycobacterium abscessus, the cystic fibrosis patient, uh, can initially colonize this patient with uh, an asymptomatic colonization and uh, depend uh, on the subject, uh, but after early years, uh, this uh, uh, often leads to a severe pro-inflammatory lung disease called the NTM pulmonary disease. And in this context, uh, it's still not clear whether the bacteria that uh, inf initially infect the patient with an asymptomatic colonization uh, can uh, have a different pathogen pathogenic potential in comparison to those associated with the advanced stage of chronic infection. So uh, the aim of our work was to understand better or to try to understand better what are uh, the bacterial features that, uh, that can account for a higher pathogenicity of this bacterium. And in particular, we wanted to understand better the contribution of the uh, bacterial persistence associated with a different disease stage, the uh, clustering uh, um, appartenance, in particular uh, the dominated circulating clones, and uh, the morphotype. So to consider all these features all together, uh, we exploited uh, uh, 11 Mycobacterium abscessus clinical strains that were longitudinally isolated from cystic fibrosis patient uh, <clears throat> at different stages of the disease, in particular at the symptomatic disease and the advanced stage of pulmonary disease. And thanks to this bacteria, we wanted to characterize their genotypic and phenotypic features to test their pro-inflammatory potential in uh, epithelial uh, cell model uh, of cystic fibrosis and uh, to try to validate some aspect uh, in uh, mouse model of respiratory infection. Uh, 
So the first step was to characterize the, um, the morphotype, uh, the, uh, the dominant circulating clone uh, feature. In particular, in this uh, project, thanks to the collaboration with the Policlinico di Milano, we were able to isolate uh, six uh, uh, initial isolates from five different CF subjects associated uh, with the asymptomatic organization. And then, uh, thanks to this collaboration, we were able to uh, uh, obtain the longitudinal strains associated uh, with uh, the um, uh, lung disease uh, uh, progression, and in particular when the NTM pulmonary disease was diagnosed uh, by the doctor, and soon before the antibiotic treatment against pseudomonas serruginosa to avoid uh, any alteration due to the uh, antibiotic treatment that the patient account. So thanks to these uh, strains, uh, we go ahead and we characterize uh, the uh, morphotype and uh, uh, we uh, were able to determine uh, that uh, uh, four out of uh, six strains associated with the symptomatic organization uh, displayed a smooth sable morphotype, while five out of five displayed a rough uh, stable morphotype at the advantage uh, of uh, the disease. Uh, moreover, in terms of uh, uh, the uh, dominated circulating clone, uh, to uh, determine this, uh, we reconstructed uh, a phylogenetic tree downloading uh, public available genomes, in particular those that were pre previously published in our laboratory and those previously published by the FLOTO group. And we were able to reconstruct uh, the main dominated circulating clone described uh, uh, worldwide. Uh, we sequence our 11 strains uh, and we observe that our 11 strains uh, were equally distributed uh, among the dominated circulating clone 1, 2 and then cluster. <clears throat> it's worth noting that in particular um, the uh, two, uh, long two couple of longitudinal strains belong to the dominated circulating clone 1 while the other were equally distributed uh, between the dominated circulating, dominated circulating clone 2 and then cluster. So uh, up to now, we were able uh, to uh, characterize uh, um, the uh, morphotype uh, features, uh, the dominator circulating clone, uh, uh, and uh, the disease associated stage uh, associated with uh, our clinical strain. So the next step was to evaluate uh, the pro-inflammatory potential of these strains uh, in cystic fibrosis epithelial cells. And so <clears throat> we took advantage of our well-characterized uh, cystic fibrosis clinical strains uh, and uh, we develop uh, an in vitro model uh, thanks uh, to the uh, cystic fibrosis epithelial cells provided by the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. We set a different uh, um, experimental protocol in terms of OI or time of infection. And uh, uh, at the end, we were able uh, to uh, characterize the ostracytomic profile in, term, uh, in terms of RNA, RNA bulk sequencing, the cytokine and chemokine release by ELISA, and the cell viability. So, we start to look uh, at the uh, bulk RNA sequencing, and in particular, uh, we wanted to evaluate the, uh, which is the bacterial feature that can account for the highest uh, host transcriptomic variation. So to do this, uh, we uh, perform a principal component analysis uh, in order to evaluate the, each bacterial feature in the same statistical model. And uh, as you can see here in this plot, uh, where uh, the principal component variable one and two can widely describe the, all the overall uh, host genetic variation, we observed that uh, when we stratified our sample uh, based on uh, the uh, uh, dominated circulating clones inclusion, uh, we found out that uh, we observe a good uh, str uh, stratification or separation of uh, our transcriptomic profile. So suggesting that uh, cells treated with different dominated circulating clone may account for a different pathogenicity. So we went ahead and we evaluated the uh, differential expression genes observed in this uh, stratification, and we found out over 700 genes uh, differently regulated in cells treated with the dominated circulating clone 1 and the dominated circulating clone 2. 
But uh, we went ahead and we wanted to stratify also our sample based on the disease associated uh, stage. And as you can see here, we achieved uh, a greater uh, the ostracytomic separation when we stratify for uh, this particular feature. It's worth noting that uh, uh, five out of uh, five strains associated with the advanced stage of the disease display the rough morphotype. So we further stratify our patient based on the phenotypic character, on the morphotype uh, feature of our bacteria. And as you can see here, we achieve the highest uh, um, and the greatest uh, ostracytomic separation uh, among our samples, suggesting that uh, this uh, uh, morphotype may in some way drive uh, the pro-inflammatory activities in our model of cystic fibrosis epithelial cells. So we go ahead to identify the genes, the differential expressed genes between samples, the epithelial cells uh, treated with rough strains and those with smooth strains. And we identify over 2,000 uh, 2, uh, genes differently expressed. We validated uh, these genes also because we found out that, uh, for example, interleukin-8 and interleukin-6 uh, were upregulated, and we, through uh, ELISA assay, we confirmed that the cells uh, treated with the rough strain secreted a higher level of IL-6 and IL-8 uh, <clears throat> in comparison to uh, the cells treated uh, with uh, the smooth strains. So to go ahead and to try to go in uh, in detail in the biological process involved in our model, uh, we analyzed the top 200 genes present in the principal component variant one uh, in order to uh, identify the uh, gene expression partner associated with the different stratification that we consider. Uh, it's worth noting that in this way we could account all the uh, different stratification in the same statistical model. And as you can see here, the uh, gene expression partner observed when we stratify for morphotype, it's uh, quite conserved also when we stratified for the dominating circulating clone and uh, is uh, uh, completely different when we stratify for cluster or uncluster stain. Suggested that again in our data set and in our mo mo uh, in vitro model, the uh, top, uh, the uh, stratification based on the mor morphotype infection drive the highest uh, pro-inflammatory activities. And in terms of gene ontology, we found out that these genes were mainly uh, involved in some process that has been widely described also in macrophage, so in process, in pro-inflammatory process uh, that activated toll-like receptors to pathway and tissue damage and remodeling process uh, um, downstreaming. So uh, up to now, we observed that uh, in our in vitro model uh, with cystic fibrosis epithelial cell line, um, the uh, morphotype uh, can in some way drive the higher and account for the higher pro-inflammatory activities. So we go ahead and we try to validate the, some aspect of uh, these uh, uh, results in, in in vivo. In particular, uh, we focus our attention only on two uh, mycobacterium abscessus clinical strains, and we focus uh, on uh, two strains belonging to the dominated circulating clone one, but display a completely different phenotype. So the FJ202 and the FJ489. And these strains were uh, exploited to infect uh, mice with an acute uh, infection model uh, associated with an early response and uh, with uh, a chronic infection model that has been previously described in the previous uh, presentation and that we recently uh, also published uh, in uh, other work associated uh, with the um, reference laboratory strains. Uh, so Due to the lack of time, I'm going to present the first data, in particular those uh, referred to the acute infection model. Uh, we uh, infect the mice by intratracheal infection, and after four days, uh, we evaluated the bacterial burden, uh, the inflammatory profile, uh, both uh, at the um, RWA level in terms of bronchial lavage fluid and in the overall lung. And, uh, <clears throat> As you can see, the uh, mice treated with the rough strains uh, after four days in due, um, were um, displayed a higher bacterial burden in comparison to the mice treated with the smooth strains. And this was observed uh, uh, in the lower airways, uh, in the airways uh, uh, through the bronchial lavage fluid, 
in the overall lung, of course. And it's worth noting that uh, we didn't observe any difference at the systemic level, suggesting that this could be a particular behaves of this, of this uh, uh, pathogen at the lung level. Moreover, we go ahead and we characterize the uh, lung infiltrating cells in the bronchial lavage fluid, and we found out that uh, rough strains uh, induced uh, a slight but higher, significantly higher uh, recruitment of monocytes and macrophages and uh, also neutrophil. We wanted to look uh, in particular in the tissue and uh, we perform uh, immunohistological analysis. And these are uh, two lobes, uh, uh, representative lobes, uh, where uh, we already found that the inflammatory areas uh, were uh, more extended in the mice treated with the rough strains in comparison to those treated with the smooth strains, as you can see also here. And then we characterized the CD68 cells uh, recruited uh, in the inflamed area. And as you can see here, we observed that uh, um, a higher amount of CD68 cells uh, in the mice treated with the rough strains. And we go ahead and we characterize also the level of INOS in order to confirm that this, uh, this macrophage may have uh, a pro-inflammatory uh, phenotype. And we found out that uh, um, mice treated the rough strain display a significantly higher level of highness in comparison to those treated, uh, to those infected with the uh, smooth strains. So we obtained similar results in the chronic infection model, in particular 14 days in terms of uh, uh, higher pro-inflammatory activities and in particular um, also neutrophil were sustained at 14 days and uh, we are going to publish soon this story, I hope. So to conclude, and because I have really a few seconds, uh, overall results suggest that uh, uh, rough morphotype seems to be associated with a, a pulmonary disease, and this has been described also by other groups, and in particular, uh, there are a couple of clinical strains that associated this type of morphotype, stable morphotype, with the advanced stage of pulmonary disease. So confirming in some way uh, the findings that we observe in our uh, small biopsy bank. Uh, moreover, we found out that in our uh, cystic fibrosis model, uh, epithelial model, uh, epithelial cell line model, uh, the morphotype certification uh, displayed for the highest pro-inflammatory variation <coughs> and tissue remodeling process uh, as observed in our data set. And we confirmed uh, uh, this observation in mouse model in particular that uh, the smooth strains uh, 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 accounted for a lower pro-inflammatory activity activities when compared with the longitudinal rough strains uh, isolated from the same patient and tested in two different mouse models, one acute model and one chronic infection model. Of course, before to conclude, I would like to thank all the people involved uh, in this project, in particular all my colleagues that uh, uh, were involved uh, in both uh, in the analysis of data and uh, in the wet part, Federico Di Marco, Fabio Saliu, Andrea Spitaleri, Francesca Nicola. Of course, I would like to thank the Daniela Cirillo, the head of, of the Emerging Bacterial Pathogen Unit, and our collaborator at the Policlinico that uh, uh, helped us uh, providing these strains. And the last but not least, uh, the Italian Cystic Fibrosis Foundation that provide us uh, funds uh, to develop this project uh, that has been recently described by also the Italian Ministry of Health. And thank you for your attention. So thank you very much. So we have a first uh, question. Um, how different are the gene contents of DC1 and 2? Could the differential content explain differences in the RNA-seq? Uh, okay, the difference uh, are bigger than the difference that we observe within the dominated circulating clone. Uh, the number of, of SNPs uh, in general uh, are not so huge, although uh, at least to differentiate uh, in term of dominate, on term of uh, clone definition. It's worth noting that uh, uh, our dominated circulating clone uh, strains are limited and uh, a further evaluation needs to be uh, addressed. What was interesting in our case was that uh, although we selected two strains belonging from the same dominated circulating clone, we account for a, diff a completely different pathogenicity. And for example, the two strains that we selected uh, display only 
uh, 12 uh, SNPs in nonsense uh, uh, mutation and one uh, insertion in the GPL locus. So few mutations account for a completely different pro-inflammatory activity, although they become from the same uh, uh, clone. Curiosity too, because I'm not familiar with uh, the mycobacteria and tuber um, abscesses. So, comparing the two morphotypes, is there any difference in virulence, or um, the the rough morphotype is only able to form more more biofilm than the the smooth one? Yeah, that that's, uh, could be a, a feature of this bacteria. In particular, it has been described, and we observe also in some of our uh, rough strains that they form cords. And uh, this is maybe a way to be protected also from antibiotic treatment or antimicrobial agents that think in some way uh, limit the growth of this bacteria. Uh, this is one of the features that uh, make the difference, but for example, probably uh, the smooth uh, strains have an advantage to persist in the environment and to initially infect the host because the inflammatory profile is lower, so it means that it can some way can evade the initial activation of the immune system, while uh, rough strains are easily uh, recognized and uh, uh, can be, at least in the initial phase, without any uh, um, damage or uh, alterate the lung function uh, can in some way be uh, easily cleared. Uh, it's also worth to mention that, for example, rough strains uh, have a limited uh, survival in the environment, and it, this is, uh, it has been described by other group, and so suggests that uh, maybe the rough strains may, uh, may associate it much more to a virulence uh, uh, with persistence, while smooth strains uh, is a different virulence that account for a appear, appearance uh, lower pro-inflammatory activity, but that account for a higher uh, capacity to infect the patient. <coughs> Any other question? Yeah. So there's a, a related question here. Um, what are your thoughts on the rough isolates being more inflammatory or virulent in the mice and their ability to cause persistent infection in people. I didn't miss the baby. What are your thoughts on the rough isolates yeah. being more inflammatory or virulent in mice and their ability to cause persistent infection in people? Okay. Uh, we don't know whether uh, we... We describe an association and all the studies that have been uh, up to now uh, uh, dedicated to the rough strains and the uh, clinical outcome uh, have been mainly, asso mainly uh, association study. And so uh, we don't know whether uh, this uh, phenotype uh, may, totally may totally account for a higher persistence. It's worth noting that in higher pro-inflammatory contest or uh, in uh, a advanced stage of the disease, uh, this morphotype may account for uh, fuel, the inflammatory process uh, that uh, is uh, uh, activated and uh, is uh, present in the patient. We don't know whether this is the cause of the inflammatory process or this is a, a variation due to the fact that the environment change and also the bacteria change its phenotype. Uh, this is something that needs to be addressed maybe in the future. I had a, a question about whether what your thoughts or what is known about what causes the switch from rough to smooth, whether it's out in the environment or perhaps also more inter interestingly within the lung environment, because that appears to happen over longitudinal isolates. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, when I speak about the environment, it's like uh, lung environment in particular. Yeah, sorry, I didn't uh, specify. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, uh, it's worth noting that is a genetic modification. So our variants that become more present in the lung uh, do over the course of the persistence, and uh, so are not just uh, a, a metabolic alteration uh, due to the pro-inflammatory environment, for example. Uh, so. Uh, 
to what has been described literally in particular by the Flotto group, uh, probably uh, the initial uh, uh, strains uh, are composed by different variants uh, and within these uh, variants uh, uh, can be generated uh, some mutated variants, for example, in the GPL locus. And then after a year of persistence and the progression of the lung disease uh, and the inflammatory environment, probably these variants uh, can have uh, a higher fitness to survive in that environment and uh, to fuel itself uh, the pro-inflammatory response uh, in order to determine their selection within the patient and not uh, inter-patient and uh, a higher pro-inflammatory burden that account uh, in this patient. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to invite the next speaker. Dr. Christina Thornton, who's assistant professor at the University of Calgary, who's going to talk to us about respiratory virus in pulmonary exacerbations. Well, thanks very much, and I'd like to thank the organizers for this invitation, and I promise one more talk before dinner, so hang in there. <laughs> um, so to change things up a little bit, what I'm going to be presenting today is a sub-analysis from the large STOP2 study that was completed um, just a couple years ago from my postdoc work um, at the University of Michigan. So uh, in terms of disclosures, I just have some postdoc funding to disclose from the CFF as well as my home institute, but nothing relevant um, for this talk. So to jump into things, we know that respiratory symptoms are hallmarks of both pulmonary exacerbations and viral infections. And certainly despite um, the nebulous entity of pulmonary exacerbations, there's no question that symptomatology such as increased cough, shortness of breath, um, and that sequelae do go together. Although viral respiratory infection rates are similar in persons with CF compared to the general population, in particular during times of stability, um, the association between pulmonary exacerbation and viral infection are unclear, in particular within the adult population. So some of the early work done in this field was back in 2014 where they did cohort analyses of CF adult um, at clinic visits versus exacerbations. And they found that the prevalence at clinical stability was about 24%, going up to close to 40% of exacerbation. But again, those studies were nearly 10 years ago. The STOP study, or otherwise the standardized treatment of pulmonary exacerbations too, this was a very large multi-center randomized controlled trial among adult patients with CF that, were, that was designed to evaluate response to different durations of IV antibiotics for pulmonary exacerbation. And because scientists are opportunistic pathogens in our own right, we took this as an opportunity to actually analyze this study and glean a bit more data from it. In particular, because sputum was collected at several time points, one of the interesting parts that we could evaluate was looking to see, well, what is the prevalence of viral infection in this cohort? And I should note as well, the STOP study, and in particular our analysis here, it's the largest study done in viral um, pulmonary exacerbations, and one of the only ones done in the post-modulator era. So it really highlighted an opportune time to study this demographic. So to go over the STOP study in a little bit of detail for those that aren't uh, familiar with it, um, the study was designed to be collected at several visits indicated um, in the diagram from V1, V2, V3. V1 was initiation of study enrollment at time of pulmonary exacerbation. V2 was an um, assessment to discern if a patient would be defined as an early robust responder, ERR, versus a non-early robust responder, NERR. The definition for this um, had to be done by clinical assessment, utilizing an FEV1 improvement by 8%, and a CRIS score, which is a symptomatic composite score used in CF of more than 11 points. Following that, patients were randomized to different antibiotic durations, of which I won't discuss much further because it's not really relevant for our study. But importantly, um, anywhere from day 24 to day 35, patients were then seen again at a third visit with sputum collected as follow-up. So for our analysis from the larger STOP cohort, we um, obtained sputum samples from 690 subjects of just over 1,300 samples to be analyzed. <clears throat> 
Um, breaking this down a little bit further by visit, so you can see visit one, visit two, visit three. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't get sample from every visit from every person. We were able to get 176, though, from all three visits, and you can see the breakdown thereafter. So fairly well distributed across the three visits and a fairly rich uh, cohort. So in terms of just the viral analysis overview, as mentioned, sputum was collected at each of these visits and were then sent to the University of Michigan. Uh, the analysis from the sputum was done by a multiplex PCR panel looking at 17, 17 different viruses. Um, good news, this study was pre-COVID, so there's no mention of SARS-CoV-2 in this talk. Um, we did perform statistical analysis noted by R and PRISM, and we looked to ascertain three specific factors which I'll go over in detail, including epidemiology and some uh, demographic characteristics, short-term outcomes as defined by the original stock study, and more interestingly um, is long-term outcomes with how these viral positive patients do versus viral negative. So amongst our cohort of 690 uh, individuals, just about 40% were positive. And as mentioned earlier, this is in line with smaller cohort studies previously published, but does expand on these findings. But one of the interesting questions one could ask is that, well, at visit one, so at the time of pulmonary exacerbation, are there certain demographic or clinical features that may help elucidate who is viral positive versus who isn't? And so a multitude of demographics were tested, most of which were garnered from the original STOP study. But what I want to point your attention to are several factors that were statistically significant between the groups. So those that were viral positive were found to have a greater FEV1 drop from their six-month average, um, about 6% versus 3.6%. They tend, tended to be more symptomatic, as noted by higher CRIS score, so a higher score is more symptomatic. Uh, these individuals tended to have a higher inflammatory profile, as noted by greater CRP, again consistent with smaller reports in the literature. And most striking and interestingly, um, individuals that were viral positive were st significantly more likely to be on modulators at visit one, uh, close to 50% as opposed to 33%. So if we break down um, between viral negative and viral positive subjects to discern what modulators they were on, it does need to be noted that the STOP study was completed just around initiation of Trikafta. So the majority of subjects on modulators are on non-highly effective uh, modulators, so preceding ETI. Uh, but the breakdown between the two groups was similar. Um, moreover, if we were interested to discern which viruses are actually present, uh, so among those 40% of viral positive individuals, about 70% were positive for human rhino enterovirus, again, consistently seen in the literature. Um, amongst the other ones, I won't go through every single one, but you can see a plethora of different viral um, uh, prevalence. Notably, this analysis was also completed for seasonality um, accounted for, and not surprisingly, in viruses that were associated with seasonality, such as influenza, followed similar patterns as we would see in the general population. Um, next, one question to look at is across different visits, was there any significant changes in terms of viral positivity, negativity, or predominance of rhinoenterovirus? And for the most part, the answer is no, it was fairly consistent across all three visits. So the next question that, that brings us to is, well, in terms of short-term outcomes in the context of our study, um, were there any differences between the two cohorts? So the STOP study, as I mentioned, had those three visits, and at each of those visits, um, clinical and laboratory parameters were collected, including FEV1, CRIS, weight, and CRP. And so at each of these visits they were compared to. And while there might be some modest differences between the two cohorts, in particular for CRIS change from visit one, visit two, and weight change from visit one to visit three, it's fairly underwhelming um, and really mimic as what is seen in the viral negative group. Um, if you're more of a visual learner, you can see here uh, a, a graphical representation, again, showing FEV1, CRIS, weight, and CRP. And again, for the most part, the lines look very similar, and there's maybe some modest differences, but nothing really of note. So the next part that's, I think, the most interesting is that in the context of the short term of the study, we're not seeing any major uh, changes between the two cohorts, but how do these patients do long term in regards to time to next pulmonary exacerbation? 
So to address this, um, we were able to get registry data that looked at time to next IV treated pulmonary exacerbation and put this into a frailty um, multivariate Cox model to discern if viral positivity was associated um, with these outcomes. Now I'll just go over these other um, demographic factors associated here, including FEV1 group, which is a measure of or surrogate of disease stage, age as well, use of CFTR modulator, female sex, and number of pulmonary exacerbations in prior year have all been clearly established in the literature as relevant and significant for future pulmonary exacerbations, as well as part of the initial STOP study. So as you can see here in this multivariate model, viral positivity was significantly associated with a decreased risk of pulmonary exacerbation um, and with time until next exacerbation. So you might be asking me, well, you just said a bunch of these people were on modulators. Isn't this just the modulator playing a role? And the answer to that is not fully, partly in because this is a multivariate model. It has accounted for the CFTR use. But to take it a step further, we actually did a further cohort um, subgroup analysis breaking up the different populations. So if you take a look here at the top, I've broken it up into different populations of virus negative, modulator positive, virus positive, modulator negative, virus positive, modulator positive, all in reference um, to the reference group for viral negativity and modulator negativity. And what you can see here is that clearly in those that are virus negative but modulator positive, again, that makes sense because modulators we know attenuate risk of future pulmonary exacerbation, there was improvement. But interestingly, even those that were not on modulator but were positive for virus still showed that protective benefit. And of course, the group that did the best of all were those that had both. Um, putting this into a Kaplan-Meier plot, um, we can see here a clear delineation of the lines in terms of viral positivity and negativity with the median time to next pulmonary exacerbation in the positive group at 255 days, so nearly an 80-day difference. And these are adjusted models for all those factors I mentioned earlier. Uh, moreover, when we break this down by our um, delineated cohort, including different modulator use and virus, again, you can see the differences there in time, terms of time to next pulmonary exacerbation with the worst group, aka negative in both, um, at about 150 days, and the best group, both, about 286 days. So. What does this all mean taken together? So I think there's a couple interesting things to take away from this that we can apply going forward, especially in the post-modulator era. So we found that over about a third of our subjects tested positive for a virus. And while that's not necessarily novel information, I think it's adjunctive to the literature that we had before in much smaller cohorts. But what is interesting is that these viral associated pulmonary exacerbations, especially those on modulator therapy, have improved outcomes. And what our working thought is that it's not so much that having a virus is a good thing, but rather it's possible that the use of modulators has unmasked what is typically viral sequelae that would be seen in the general population anyway. And so are these really overt pulmonary exacerbations as we know, or are these simply viral infections that all of us would have, aka a cold. And so I think it also gets that concept of how nebulous defining what a pulmonary exacerbation is, but this is adding that um, piece to it. Um, moreover, especially I think as a clinician myself, what I find interesting is how we can take this information to personalize it going forward. So we know now in CF, and we heard from many talks, even the plenary earlier, how this disease is especially heterogeneic and our patients are no different. And so if we can be able to discern early on if these patients are experiencing a viral exacerbation based on some of those prognostic or demographic features I showed earlier, perhaps we may be so bold as to one day develop a study that has arms of no antibiotics for exacerbation versus another um, to really try and limit that exposure in this population. So with that, um, I just want to thank my supervisors, uh, Dr. John LaPuma and Dr. Lindsay Caverly, um, of course the lab in Michigan and the STOP study um, group, um, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. I'll start with a question. Um, you had uh, uh, commented on how having a viral infection may not be protective per se, uh, indeed. And I was wondering if you thought that uh, another possibility was that perhaps it wasn't about um, having 
viral infection, but of the ones that did not have it, they would have some other cause of a pulmonary exacerbation that may have a poor outcome. And I don't know what those other triggers may be, but yeah. is that something you have any insight on? I think that's a great question. So more and more, um, both in CF and non-CF bronchiectasis, is actually, we're learning about non-infectious triggers as well as causes of pulmonary exacerbation. So for example, um, allergic exposures. There was a beautiful paper in the Blue Journal last year about eosinophilic phenotypes in bronchiectasis. Um, so you're right. I think what we can say is they don't have the classic bacterial pathogen dogma exacerbation that we're used to treating and evaluating. Um, but in terms of other triggers, it's tough to say, and I, I would love to study that in the future. <laughs> yeah. Um, next question is, do you know whether the incidence of sub subsequent uh, virus in, oops, in fact, oh yeah, that's true. Infection and, and exacerbation was lower in the positive group? Um, okay, so good question. So I can't comment in terms of subsequent viral infection because we did not test subsequent samples in terms of PCR positivity or ascertain their clinical records. But I can state with regards to pulmonary exacerbations based on that Kaplan-Meier data um, as well as the hazard uh, multivariate analysis I showed earlier that yes, in the viral positive group they had a longer time to next pulmonary exacerbation. You had shown some data about um, different viruses. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you had the numbers, but if you stratified by yeah. type of respiratory viruses, were some causing worse uh, outcomes than others? You've read our mind. So yes, we did that analysis. Um, so you're right, we didn't have the numbers to go by every single subtype of virus. So I did the exact same analysis a few different ways. Um, I looked at rhinovirus and terovirus versus other. There was no difference in terms of any short-term, long-term outcomes or clinical demographics. I did have enough to look at influenza as well when combined with influenza A and B. Same thing, no significant difference in terms of any of these outcomes. So it really does seem to be not so much the viral pathogen itself. Now again, this was predating SARS-CoV-2, so <laughs> all of that aside. Um, but yes, so to answer your question, I, based on that stratification, I didn't see any differences. Are there any other questions? Oh, I think there's a hand. Oh. Go ahead. Oh, do you, pseudomonas do you, positivity. Do you see any yeah. difference between P sure. pseudomonas yeah. positive versus negative patients? Yes, for sure. Thank you. Yeah, so the question is around pseudomonas um, positivity or colonization at time of visit one. So yes, I did look at that. So I looked at multiple different pathogens that we were given as part of the data set, including pseudomonas, MRSA, MSSA, NTM, based on the theme of today's talks, um, Acromobacter, Burkholderia. There was no significant difference in any of those between... In the outcome, no, that was not analyzed as part of this. No, just at initiation, yeah. Because I think you're getting at in, the, in some of the RSV data where RSV epithelial damage and then subsequent acquisition of pseudomonas in pediatric populations, but, oh. Absolutely. I'm interested too because the only in vitro data I could find was from that work around the RSV, pseudomonas, endothelial damage, and then subsequent infection and colonization. But no, as far as I read, there is nothing else that I could appreciate. There's some small studies in SARS-CoV-2 that I saw, but no, this study wasn't designed to look at that, but good future ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I will, uh, Dao and I would like to thank you everyone for the, first the speakers for the great talks and the audience for the great discussion. So thank you so much. <laughs>